Hello. Hello. We're coming at you live from Madeira. And uh, we are really excited to be talking today about the ultimate cruising yacht criteria. Yes. For us personally. Yes. So we've done a lot of videos about sailboat stuff like the knowledge and like the different setups and everything and like unbiased yeah like t just, just talking general sailboat basics yeah like keel design and rudders and cutters versus sloops and things like that yeah. all unbiased but today you're gonna hear after three plus years of cruising full-time what our actual ultimate cruising boat would be yes and spoiler it's not wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this isn't going to be a, look at our boat, it's so great. It's uh, the best boat doesn't exist. Yeah. That's why there's also no pictures because every single thing has flaws. So while we're waiting for some people to come on in, we're going to give you a little update about our current situation, where we are and where we're going. And so how COVID has affected our cruising. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so right now we are in Madeira, as I mentioned. And Madeira, for those of you who don't know, is an archipelago of islands off of, kind of like straight out of the Med, a thousand miles outside the Med. Um, but they are Portuguese, and we love them. Yes, the food here is so good. <laughs> <laughs> and they're famous for their Madeira wine, which has been so Excellent. good. Yes. <laughs> And we're actually getting ready now, uh, in today and the next couple days, we're getting ready to leave here and begin our ocean crossing, which we technically already began as soon yeah. as we got out of the Mediterranean, but yeah, now we we're going to go Gibraltar. down to <laughs> Cape Verde. Yep. And that's going to be another thousand miles. And then we're not going to wait for hurricane season to end because hurricane season has been crazy and ridiculous. So we're heading to Suriname in South America. Which is considerably south of the hurricane belt. Yes, yeah, so we'll be crossing south of all the hurricanes while they're just, you know... Chilling. Doing their thing. <laughs> just being a hurricane. Yes. You know, twirling. <laughs> Uh, so that's pretty much it. That's our update. Um, Wisdom is in great condition right now. Uh, the chain plates are all figured out. Yep, We've that's got, all been fixed. It's all fixed. Uh, everything is good. The sails are in, all in good condition. And Yeah, it's nice. We've been in this yeah. marina. Nothing's broken. I've been doing bright work yeah. and cleaning. It, yeah, we've actually been nice. able to do bright work and ex exploration instead yeah. of worrying about... Repairs. Yeah, which has been a first. <laughs> Uh, hello, Chris. Welcome, Patrick. Hey, special hi to Patrick and Susie because they tuned in yesterday thinking that this was yesterday. <laughs> so sorry about the confusion, but I'm so glad you guys are here with us today. <laughs> we miss your faces and uh, we're really, really excited. So I think we should jump in. Yes. So. And talk about. So, disclaimer we don't have a photograph or a picture or diagram of our ultimate cruising boat because it doesn't exist because no boat is perfect um, we're just gonna be talking about individual criteria of a boat that if we could build the ultimate perfect cruising boat for us and that's important for us this is what it would be and let's begin yeah so let's start with the rigging because that's kind of our thing <laughs> so it would be a cutter with check stays instead of running back stays and the reason for the check stays is well when we were coming from Gibraltar to here we had a bit of an issue with our rigging where chain plates said goodbye and the check stays act as a cap shroud three quarters of the way up the mast so if your cap shroud lets go well you still have a really high shroud we would so. also put the chain plates on the outside. Yeah, Whereas that way ours they're... currently are in the inside, so it's very difficult well, to check them. So what she means is like bolted to the outside of yes. the hall. Ours are at the hall, but just inside. So they like pop through the deck, so then we get leaks in the deck and just It's stuff. been an ongoing thing. Yeah. <laughs> Usually I recalk the chain plates. Mm -hmm. Or they leak. <laughs> so why cutter versus sloop? Yeah, so cutter versus sloop because cutter, you just have more redundancy in the rigging. So if a stay breaks well you know that stinks but there's a few more that are doing its same job and you're you're good to go like you're not the mast isn't going to fall over right away so that's 
that's my huge thing. Like, whenever I see someone, like, heading out on, like, a fractional rig sloop, I'm like, good luck. <laughs> Hope you make it. <laughs> because it's like, if your head stay goes, the mast falls. If the back stay goes, the mast falls. If just any single stay goes, usually the mast goes. So you just have to be, if you have a sloop, you just have to be that much more diligent about checking your rigging. It's not really... Yeah, it's that not, big of a deal. Yeah, like, the there's so many people shape. with sloops. Our other boat is a sloop. Yeah. But if given the choice, cutter. Yeah. And then. Hi, HB. It's my dad. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, the other thing with the. Uh, like if the rigging's in good shape, you're good to go. But then uh, also with the spreaders, they'd be lateral spreaders because the ones that are swept aft, they're. Just everything in that rigging is much more high strung. It's under more stress. And then more stress means more breaking. So just, you know, lots of extra shrouds. Rigging that isn't necessary. That's just up there. Yes, it's extra windage. But if something breaks, you have just more to hold it. Uh, Patrick asked, are you going to stick with synthetic rigging? And oh, I'm yes. glad you asked because that's a perfect segue into the next thing, item, which is synthetic rigging. Yeah, so synthetic for us, because we don't like freezing cold. But if someone's going up into the Arctic, synthetic would be horrible because as it gets colder, it, it actually creeps. elongates. Yeah. No, not creep. Oh, really? Yeah, creep is a different thing. Oh. It's just elongate. It's like water. As it freezes and turns into ice, it gets a little bigger. Uh, Dyneema does the same thing. It gets a little longer. So then your rigging would be too long up north. And then out in the cold, you have to tighten it. And just, I don't want to deal with that. But so, for us, yes, synthetic is optimal. Yeah, so for someone going really north, or if we were going really north, it'd be steel with compression fittings, not swage, because swage is just not good. But compression fittings, they, they do a good job. They're really reliable. Um, we love the synthetic rigging. We do it all over again if given the chance. But turnbuckles. But we would have turnbuckles yeah. because it's so much easier to adjust the rigging. Yep. Um, Dead eyes are great uh, because eyes they're are, cheaper. Yeah, <laughs> if did, you can make your own. Yeah, we did dead eyes because it's what we could afford at the time. Yeah, and now I mean we could slowly through the years like go replacing one or two as we go, but the fact is they just they're working. Like everything's fine. I don't have to tune the rigging all the time, so I just don't worry about it. Right now we're kind of the tester boat for synthetic this specific synthetic setup, and so. Uh, so far, it has been excellent. We obviously can't predict what's going to happen down the line, but as far as things are going, it really does look like it's going to last significantly longer than a steel rig would. Yeah, so steel rigging you're supposed to replace every 10 years, but... Oh, wait. Is there any chance the Dyneema assisted in the failure of the chain plates? No, actually. Mm -hmm. So those stays were actually pretty slack. It's a good question. The chain plates on this boat are actually original. It's just that the chain plates really were old. really old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that that's was all that, that was. <laughs> I, so you're supposed to replace the chain plates every 10 years, uh, like on the clock. And these are way past that point. But we will be replacing them when we get back to the States in yeah. bronze. Again. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, these are stainless steel. And, oh, well, bronze chain plates would be on the list of the ideal boat. Because yeah. bronze won't get crevice corrosion. Yeah. You know, um, and so, I mean, we could go into synthetic a lot more. Uh, For and, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> the the real, the big picture here is that, yes, we would do it again, and it would be on our ultimate cruising boat. It's lighter, and it's easier to spot any kind of uh, problems. Issues, yeah. Yeah. And it's just a lot less problematic to issues. Yeah. So. Um, and so, we are going to go back a step, and talk yeah. about keels yes keels and hall shapes and stuff mm -hmm. so we are a long keel we're not actually a full full keel because a full full keel it's like at the bow the keel just drops straight down it's just flat across the bottom we're more like a weird wedge uh, but our optimal boat would be, would a, be a full full, full keel, keel. Yeah. yeah and heavy displacement yeah, which so, comes along with that yeah so just a big heavy brick in the water <laughs> Which is what we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reason we prefer that is because we're going out in conditions that are sometimes unpredictable. 
And as you've seen in our videos, we've hit a lot of storms and some crazy weather and we've felt safe the entire time because we've been in this giant, heavy brick yeah. <laughs> of a boat. And so safety for us is number one. Yeah. So it's like you can go out in a really light boat that'll get there super fast and miss storms because it goes while the weather's good. But we're going so far that a storm's going to hit us just statistically. So we'd rather be in something super strong and safe that can to outlast, ride out the storm. Yeah, yeah, outlast the storm rather than run away from it. Yeah. So there's a question about how oft, how many times a year do I tune our synthetic rigging? And it would be zero. The last time I tuned it was three years ago. <laughs> so that's why yeah. not we didn't switch the turnbuckles. Such low maintenance. Yeah. Once it's in the beginning when it's creeping and like, you know, settling in on your mast, it's a lot of tuning. Oh, that's when it's creep. Yeah. Yeah. Got after it. after it's settled in, then it's just it's just there. You don't think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Except when you're checking for chafe. And honestly, that's like, oh, is that's there it. chafe? No. Okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, full keel, very stable. Yes. Awesome. Yep. Um, yeah. It's just so much more comfortable a ride the, as well. It's less bumpy. The other big thing, having a full keel, your bilge comes down and goes really deep. So that means any water in your bilge is down deep. So when you heal, the water stays in your bilge. If you're uh, these like ultra light flat bottom boats, when they heal a little bit, the water ends up sloshing up into your cabinets. And that stinks. So, <laughs> Always fun. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, like just, we like the full keel. Right. For, for living circumstances and such as ours. And we do have special circumstances because we are long term living in our boat. So yeah. our ideal cruising boat, like I'm going to keep saying this, it's really different from what your ideal cruising boat might be because we have no time constraints and we want comfort. We want something that will last a very long time with a lot of wear. And yeah. so for us, this is. Yeah. So another thing that goes along with the whole heavy displacement is there's a ratio uh, called comfort ratio. It's uh, Ted Brewers came up with it and it's literally just a number that's like, if you are a small number, like a low number, like, you know, one to five or so, you're like a little dingy and like the slightest wave, the boat starts like flinging around and then it goes all the way up. The heavier you are, the higher your number is because the motion of the boat is slower, which means you don't get tossed, which means you don't throw up as much. <laughs> so yeah, we're currently, our boat is either 52 or 54 on that scale and most uh, Maddie throws up on that. So the thought, like, we've been We're on boats. We're actually very high on the scale. Yeah, we've been on boats. Yeah. Like, your average cruising boat is in the 30s. And I'm like, man, if Maddie's puking in a boat that's in the 50s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the ML, I think, was in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that and the Naiad. They're mm. both, uh, like, 34, 38, somewhere around there. And they boast incredibly high comfort ratios. Yeah. It's just, nowadays, they make boats lighter. Yeah. Because. Coming in go. here, yeah. I saw a question. Okay. Um, oh, what do you think about an Alberg 37 to single hand from yes, Johnny? They are beautiful, uh, especially we the We love Albergs. <laughs> yeah. The, the 37 yeah. also came as a y'all. And while I, I love y'alls, I think they're just the second most beautiful, second to a schooner. Uh, we would still go with a single mast on our ideal boat because... Uh, well, it just gets more complicated. Yeah, sailing on the ML, it's like you do everything, but then there's another mast behind you have to tend to, and it's trimming this, and just like they're they're very useful, but I wouldn't. I love looking at other people's multi mast boats. But you could single hand it. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I used to single hand wisdom, uh, like docking in marina, yeah. and I'd pick up mooring balls under sail, and yeah. So you you can do it alone. Um, so we've talked about our full keel, our heavy displacement hull, and we want to talk, talk about our uh, keel, at the, the mast. <laughs> yeah, so the mast, single spreader, cutter rig, you know, all mm -hmm. the extra rigging on it. Kind of our keel that we have right now. Mast. Mast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah lateral spreaders, yeah. not aft swept, and then keel stepped, mm -hmm. and then hank on sails, but... The difference, the thing that we don't have is all of the halyards be internal halyards. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so we have, most of our halyards are internal, but one of them isn't. And that one is 
always clanging and telling you that, hey, I'm, I'm external. <laughs> yeah. It's, All night long. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I barely even hear it anymore, to be honest, but we've had some neighbors talk about it before. Yeah. So like, usually like if we're not going to sail for a long time, I'll actually tie the halyard to the bow rope, like both ends of the halyard. That way it's just away from the mast. Yeah. Otherwise it's just clang, 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 clang. Sickness equals anesthesia. I could give you some Lodi King. Not yet. <laughs> oh, oh, hello, hey, Kate. Kate. Good to see you. Slash hear from you. Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's, that's the thing. Like, all the halyards be internal. So our staysail, it's the one that has the external halyard. But all of our others are thankfully internal. Yes. Um, as for the keel step mast, it's interesting because we actually recently put out a video about keel versus deck step masts. And it's gotten a lot of kind of uh, headbutting in the comments, which is fun for us. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to read them. It's yeah. like, mm, you're very passionate about <laughs> stuff. That you... um, but the reason, we have many reasons why we would choose a keel step mast for our own personal boat. Yeah. And uh, one of them is stability of the mast. I think that's probably the biggest one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, one thing that was a little... Uh, concerning in the comments were a lot of people saying that their keel step mast it doesn't actually touch the deck there's a big donut around it and a gap that's actually supposed to have wedges in it so if you are any of those people that have the open <laughs> gap around your mast get some wood and put some wedges in it <laughs> um yeah that should be quickly. a thing people yeah. were talking about leaks and things like that yeah um, it's just it's maintenance i am yeah. boats there is no maintenance-free thing on a boat. Everything is constant maintenance. So it's just which maintenance do you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> and then, so a huge thing, since everyone that has a keel step mast that is not in their shower is complaining about water in their bilge and all. Yes, Shane. Oh. Wedges. Yes. No, no. <laughs> Those are question marks. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm saying yes. It is supposed to have wedges. Oh. Oh, as for the spreaders, uh, one, one set. One set. Yeah. So single spreader and then check stays at the three quarter mark. So it's literally the first half of the mast is unsupported. Then you have your spreaders and your lowers and all. And then three quarters of the way up, you have your check stay and then your cap shred. Um, if you have more than one set of spreaders, your mast is, if it does break, is more likely to break on the first set of spreaders. So if you have many, then your mast is breaking to a smaller yeah. uh, ratio. Yeah, so if you have... One set of spreaders, your mast breaks in half. If you have two sets of spreaders, your mast breaks at one third of it, and the other two thirds falls. If you have three spreaders, you have a quarter of a mast left. That's yeah. not so great. So, so our current mast is fifty-five ish above water feet. Yeah. yeah, above water. So maybe sixty-three. Yeah, Patrick. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so keel stepped. Um, we talked about hang on sails. No, but hank on. No <laughs> furlers at all. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> so oh. this is uh, something that we have kind of felt passionate about from the beginning, but it was brought even more to the forefront of our um, sailing. Sorry. Oh. Whenever we do We're... this, it's because yeah. somebody <laughs> okay, <laughs> just Okay, so sent there's a, a question about <laughs> the mast leaking and what do we do to keep it out? I... So. First off, have the mast in your shower. Then any water that does leak in goes into your shower. And mm -hmm. then it's it's out in the sump. But if you're already the boat is already built and everything and it's not in your shower. Then you have to do the other stuff, which is at the top hinge, and then you shove the wedges in around the mast, and then you wrap all of that in rigging tape. So it's kinda like shrink wrap tape, and that just seals it to the mast. And then on top of that, you put a mass boot that seals. And then at the top, uh, people don't usually do this, but they should. You put 4,200 in between the mast boot and the mast, and then between the mast boot and the deck flange. And you just like seal it on. It's just like all encapsulated in 4,200. Nothing's getting in there. Yeah. Ours is not leaking. At all. So, <laughs> yeah. But when it does leak, if I don't like freshen up the caulking every year, then it, you know, dribbles in a little mm -hmm. into the shower. Yes. So, yes. Thank you for that question. Um, Hank on sails. So we were recently, as you know, um, well, sailing on, yes. Uh, question. Uh, silicone. All right. So silicone 
is not really good for you. So silicone's really good when you're compressing between two things, but it's not really that great on a boat. And 5200 is something that you use if you hate the guy that works on your boat. So 4200 is removable. 5200 is a nightmare. Like you'll it, it will come off, but oh my god, it is so much work. So 4000 or 4200, either of those two. Yes. Yes. Back to all right. So now we're <laughs> going to talk about the furling or hank on. Yeah. So yeah. we were recently sailing on an Amel and a an Nyad. And both of them had furling sails. Furling everything. Furling everything. And it was like in-mast furling and it, the it, it was the yeah, most they, furling. There was a <laughs> continuous furler for the Code Zero. Yeah. The head sail was, you know, a hydraulic furler on one, rope furler on the other. And then both masts, or all the masts on all these boats had uh, in-mast furling. Now, I completely understand the desire for furling for single-handing people, especially those uh, who are less physically able, um, because especially if everything is run back to the cockpit, because then it's like easy peasy, yeah. sail in, sail out. But the problem is, and it will always be, if something happens to your furler, when when something happens to your furler, you've got major problems. And yeah. those problems can, in our opinion, not They're, be outweighed by having Hank on sales. <laughs> yeah. The the convenience of, like, you can, on the ML, you push a button and the sail unfurls, uh, or furls back in, was convenient, but rarely worked. Like, yeah. the sail would get stuck, like the, the in-mast ones, the sail would get pinched in the mast. Like, one of the two masts would get pinched every time we're putting it in or out. And then the Code Zero... Would, the Code Zero was a that disaster. Was a, oh, my God. Yeah. yeah, that was just so... And it's not usually a disaster, but when it is mm, a disaster... It's big. It's really bad. It took yeah. three of us to hold down that sail, and we almost lost it. Yeah. And um, the thing was, it was, like, going, and it's such a big sail, we were worried about it literally breaking the rigging. Yeah. Like, it was just... I wish we'd gotten it on video, but again, it was such all a, three of yeah, us it was were a trying panic situation. to hold down the sail and get yeah. it back. Um, so, we... <laughs> All of our kind of reservations towards furling were yeah. even so, more... So we had furling on this boat. We did. Like, when I bought it, it had a furler and a Genoa and all that stuff. And it was... When the wind picked up, it was hard for me to furl the sail in. And, you know, I changed the bearings and worked on it. It was just hard to work. And then we switched to Hank on because the staysail was Hank on and was just so much easier to, like, put up and down compared to the, to the Genoa. And I even tried like a Yankee, so a smaller sail, so it'd be less pressure. And it was still just this hassle. And so we actually took the furler off and went Hank on. Like it was by choice, not by poverty. And yeah. it's, so we always wondered in the back of our mind, well, were we just not as experienced? And that's why we didn't like the furler. And, you know, we just got used yeah. to the Hank on. But then. But now that we're really experienced, it's like. Yeah. When we went on those boats, we were like, oh, this is constantly a problem. <laughs> yeah. Like, on both of the boats. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Hank on sales all the way. Yay. Uh, hello from oh. Dauphine Island. Oh, cool. Oh, hey, Melinda. Great to hear from you. Yeah. Yes, everyone, uh, like, subscribe, all those things. Yeah, I see 103 of you on here, which is amazing. Thank you so much for being here with us as we talk about our ultimate cruising yacht criteria. All the nitty picky details. Yes. And, um... 104 of you and only 30 likes. <gasps> so go ahead and take a moment to hit that like button while we talk about motors. Yes, motors. Motors. Yeah, we also had some experiences with motors <laughs> on those uh, boats. Um, the biggest question we get uh, is... Wait, wait, super fast. What is a Yankee? Oh. A Yankee is a jib. Honestly, if you look at like an old square rigger boat, those head sails that they have, like, a bunch of them, those are Yankees. They're, like, they look like napkins with, like, a super sharp angle in them. That's a Yankee. <laughs> what do you think about a deck step mast with a support post that goes through the deck? Saw this many years ago. Yes, yeah, so the, the support post is a compression post. Uh, it's, I still prefer keel step. I mean, our other boat, the Auberg, is deck stepped. So it's not that we're, like, no, don't get one. It's just, yeah. I... I prefer keel stepped. When step. given the choice for long-term cruising, keel stepped. 
Yeah. You can, the rigging can be looser on a keel step boat, which is then less stress on everything to the boat, and then everything lasts longer. Where deck step, if you had your rigging as loose as we have ours, on a deck step, your mast might fall down. Not, <laughs> not kidding. Like, it actually, like, if you ever look, like, our shrouds are, like, just flapping just like, and doo -doo 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 -doo. loose. It's like, because they can, mm -hmm. because it's keel stepped. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Moving um, on to okay, motors. Okay, so motors. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, like I was saying, biggest question we get is now that we've got ocean crossing and three years under our belt and also been on these other boats that had diesels after having been on an electric for so long do we have regrets yeah would we do it again no regrets <laughs> yes we would do it again yes um but a little differently yes always uh battery setup is big uh, yeah for us the electric the motor and the battery setup go hand in hand um so we would have lithium in our yeah. ultimate boat lithium absolutely we would be able to uh run for much longer <laughs> yes and much faster and much more powerful yeah uh so yeah. yes electric motor um but the thing is we would also have uh a diesel generator a dc diesel generator so for like just you know the typical sailing that we do where it's like you know just putter out of the marina or putter back in and you know anchoring whatever just like the little putters you don't need to crank up an engine like the batteries will do it and then after you're done running the motor for that short moment the solar panels put it back in mm -hmm. so then you're good to go uh but if you want to like get somewhere like we that. had um we were when we were on those two other boats uh mostly we were just on the ml when we were on the ml uh the captain had time constraints and wanted to get to places fast yeah and so if the speed went less than six we, he turned on the motor and we kept like six or seven knots it was mm -hmm. nice like you got somewhere and our on our like, sat phone here. on our map oh it's if, a nice straight line if you look at it you can see it's a perfectly straight line we just went whoop and that has never happened to us before and it was fun it was cool but there were aspects of it that i really um didn't love uh everything is a trade-off Yes, we got there in a in a good amount of time, and it worked out great for us because we were just uh, crew. Along for the ride, yeah. Yeah, um, and we didn't have to pay the diesel fees, but Which, oh my gosh, oh, they were huge. That is expensive, yeah. Yeah, um, the fees were enormous, and once we got to like Cartagena and um, Ibiza, for instance, we didn't feel quite as uh, accomplished because we had just turned on the motor and driven. Yeah, it was kind of like the same for, like, if you just rent a car and just drive somewhere. Yeah, like, we could have just, it was like driving someplace instead of sailing, which, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> um, so that kind of thing for us is very important about sailing. Uh, I spend like $60 on diesel every two years. Wow, nice. good for you. Yes. You're doing it right. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. That's great to hear. Uh Let's see. For a boat around your displacement, how much battery bank and how large a generator do you think you'd need? Okay. okay. So while we were in Austria <laughs> in the lockdown, I had a lot of dreamy, dreamy time. Oh, and, and wait. First, okay. before we get into that, just quickly, which Amel? Super Maramo. Uh, it was 90... from 90... 92? Uh, it wasn't the 2000. Wait. It was the one before. 1990s something yeah mid 90s well i don't know if the 2000 was on the year 2000 but there's the super marmo 2000 yeah. and this was the amel super marmo yeah i learned this all very recently <laughs> on these amels um yeah so okay um now about the so the battery that's a big question yes yeah, so, um <laughs> well, while we were in austria yeah. in the lockdown uh on our trip in the van through europe we saw all these buses that run on electric and i was looking at what they have to power these giant buses for all day running and they have a 200 kilowatt battery bank i want that <laughs> <laughs> that would be my dream um it was expensive yeah which is why it's a dream it kind but, of brings us to the next point about generators yeah which is why the generator because so we you, would have a generator yeah a, a diesel dc generator that mm -hmm. way it doesn't have to go through uh converters and all to switch yeah. it over to dc it's yeah. just pumps out the power our so. perfect boat would have a dc generator and an electric motor and a lithium battery bank a nice like a good sized Big lithium one. battery that yeah. way you don't need to run the generator much like we've run our gas generator to charge the batteries in horda mm. that was a bit 
I think that was it. Yeah. We may have run it a little bit in the doldrums no. on the way to Bermuda. I feel yes, like we, we ran it the yeah. day before we got to Bermuda. That way we'd have full charge for, for getting docking. in there. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's it. Like, we really, like, in the ICW, we ran that thing every day, all the time. And it was just, that was the thing. Problem but, is, you're getting an electric motor because to get rid of annoying things about diesels, like noise and fumes. And then you crank and up the motor. And then you ch- crank up the generator. And yeah, it's, it's the like... same thing. Now, the difference, though, <laughs> the, so we actually met a uh, really nice couple here on a gorgeous 63-foot Nordhaven. Oh, uh, it was now, amazing. the thing was, the boat runs at seven and a half knots at 1200 RPM. He can't run slower than that because that is the slowest the motor is supposed to run. It's supposed to go around 1400 and top out at 1800. So it's a slow turning diesel, but he goes seven and a half knots and can't go any slower. It's like if he were electric, he could go any speed he wants and the generator runs at its optimum conditions when it's ready and needed. So that's why I really like the, the electric and generator because if you don't need the power right now, you can just run on the electric and then charge with solar. And then if you're really going to be running a long time, you can crank up the generator. And then you have the range of a diesel. Yeah. Because that's the downfall of electric is the range. Yeah. But, but, but that 200 kilowatt battery bank would let us run at full speed for 10 hours. Whereas right now it's 20 minutes. Yeah, so that's why uh, the 200 So kilowatt. what is keeping you from going after said forever yacht? Uh, oh. It just doesn't exist. Yeah, um, it, I, cost, <laughs> cost would be a thing. Cost, and also we, I mean, we're very loyal to wisdom. We yeah. really love wisdom. It's ta- She's taken care of us through this whole journey, and yeah. she's our home. And the other thing is, like, your the, the perfect boat doesn't really exist because a lot of the things that we like mm. are counterintuitive, or counterproductive to each other. So, well, actually, so the very next thing is where would the motor be mounted? So our motor is under the floor. And I think that's a horrible idea because... Especially for electric. Yeah. (laughs) It's like literally the motor's down in the bilge. So if the boat is sinking and you don't realize it until water comes over the floorboards, the motor is now underwater at that point. So the motor should be above the floor somewhere like they do in pretty much every other boat. <laughs> but the problem when you do that, you put the motor up higher, so then to get the prop down deep, the prop shaft is at a pretty steep angle, and then you get really bad prop walk. And So everything yeah. you, like, so you have to make sacrifices with everything you choose. Yeah, so I actually, uh, so our motor is actually really low and a straight, perfectly horizontal prop shaft. So we have a lot of prop walk, but less than it would have been if the motor were higher. So it's like stuff like that. It's like, well, do you want to trade this problem for that problem? There's no yeah. perfect answer. And I mean, those are, wait, super oh, fast. Yeah. There was a question about the Allen Packet 380. I love that boat. My favorite is actually the Allen Packet 38, but the 380 is just an updated version. And I think, it, yes, it's that is my boat. answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say that at the end, we'll probably go, like, we'll talk about. How, the fact that wisdom, we're kind of slowly making wisdom fit our perfect boat. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about how she fits in there, but we'll leave that to the end. Yep. Uh, and there were a few questions that I'm going to look at here because I want to get to you guys. Um, how do you get out of bad weather without an engine? We don't. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, <laughs> bad weather is preceded by waves, so it doesn't catch us off guard. So we... Right see the we know it's coming and start getting out of its way yeah and then as it's approaching you then get wind which you then use to further get out of its way and then if we just didn't you heave too so the thing is uh when you have a motor like this you really need to know your weather and weather patterns and you need to be prepared for everything so when we see weather coming we just get out of its way which is really easy to do on the ocean where you can see forever almost yeah um, but that doesn't mean we haven't been hit by bad weather. That's and in that case, that's why we have the boat that we have, um, the full keel, heavy displacement that can just weather, weather the storm, out. literally. Yeah. Um, so really the answer is we, we don't, uh, deal with bad weather. We just kind of ride it out, have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just happens and we're fine. <laughs> Uh, many, goodness, many yes. questions. Guys, this is awesome. I love how you're participating. 
Uh, there's a movie called The Weight of Water where they had their motor under the floor. Yep. Looks not great. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Wonder how much solar you need for EV propulsion to beat d diesel. Well, honestly, if we had two kilowatts of solar panel, we would be really happy because we motor a lot at 0.4 kilowatts. So two kilowatts would be very nice. Yeah. So, yeah, we have 0.15 kilowatts solar panel. <laughs> Which is really not enough. No. <laughs> um, oh. Center or rear cockpit, we're going to yes. talk about that. I promise. Um, is it on here? <laughs> yes, it's. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, thanks to the IP380, one is available. Yeah. Yeah. They're very nice. Um, you don't use electric to get weather warnings? Oh, oh electronics. electronics. Oh, okay. Wait. <laughs> we don't really. Okay, so we used to. Yeah. And it became a joke that whatever the forecast said, prepare for the opposite and you'll be correct. Because it was just always wrong always wrong and we just <laughs> got so it was like what so so that and then we have a bunch of friends that like swear by predict win and are perpetually going out when predict win says it'll be great and then getting hammered so we actually just read the weather yeah um the and it's way. worked out really well for us yeah you look at the sky and you see the clouds and literally like the weather doesn't just like pop on you yeah. like it it comes in and yeah. it's got all these warnings and it like comes with clouds and it comes with seas. We and, also like, look at use yeah. our barometer. Um, yes. And we try to stay in the 1080. Uh, 1020. 10, 10, I always do that. 1020 yeah. range. We used to film in 1080. Yes, so. that's why. <laughs> uh, we always stay in the 1020 range when we can. And uh, there are great books about weather. There are classes about weather. I highly recommend it because really. That's the, been our weather thing. The best way to tell the weather is your eyeballs. Yeah. So you are your own little forecast guy on your boat for your little world. Especially if you're going long term. I mean, you can't yeah. possibly predict weather more than like 10 days out. So, uh, la la la. Solar at two kilowatts sounds practical. Yes, so it would be practical if you have the space for it, which we don't. But mm -hmm. we, yeah, yeah. So that, that's the whole issue yeah. is where do you put it? Uh, Melinda yeah. says smash that like button. Uh, Amen, yes. Amen, um, Amen. <laughs> Amen, Amen, Melinda. Amen, Melinda. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sail drive for electric is very compact, ah. just really expensive. Yes. Okay, so I personally don't like sail drives because... Oh, that's they... a good question, Kevin. I'll yeah, so that. the sail drive, it just hangs out like a little dingleberry under the boat and just stuff can hit <laughs> it and break it. And, like, a lot of stuff happens to them, and if they leak, it's bad. Like... There's a lot of problems that come with all the convenience of a sail drive. Whereas if you have a shaft to a prop that's at your full keel, so the prop is in an aperture, so everything's just really protected. Just that. Uh, that's my opinion of sail drives. I when we did the electric, I actually looked at doing two sail drives off the side of the like each side of the bilge or each side of the keel. And my thought was, oh, then I'll, you know, have two motors and just all that stuff. And then I started looking into it and it's just, I was like, no, nah, we'll do single <laughs> screw. And yeah. Just view a police chase. I don't know what he means. Uh, let's oh, see. okay. Um, I came in late lines to cockpit or on ah, mast. Okay. Uh, um, I have made a note and we're going to talk about that when we talk about the cockpit. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's a really good question. Sail drive to get the shaft going. Uh, vertical and extend yeah. it much higher. Motor can be vertical. Yes. Yeah, so sail drives are awesome, but I just don't like the the exposedness of them. Like actually, in the video we did about propellers and stuff, I talked about sail drives and like they are the perfect way to get a propeller, and especially for regen. Yeah. Check out that video. It's actually really good. Yeah. But I just my personal thing is. Yeah. I wouldn't want that. Uh, Hank has a question. Is there a brand and model of electric motor that you'd prefer to have over what you have? That's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, so I've we've looked into, or at least I have. Yeah. Uh, I've looked at Torquedo and uh, Ocean Volt. Right now we have and, electric yacht. Yeah, we have electric yacht. Quiet Torque 20. Yeah. So the motor in the electric yacht is made by Mont Energy. And I like that because... If Ocean Volt or Torquedo or any other brand, uh, Thusa, like if they stop production, that's it. It's gone. Like they're not making them anymore. Munt Energy makes this electric motor for like all sorts of applications, forklifts, like just 
all sorts of junk. And th they're out there. So if like they stop making it, someone's going to build something that'll replace it because it's such a prevalent motor. It's not only in boats. This is go-karts and golf carts and all sorts of things. So I, I really like... I like motors that are made uh, for more than just marine applications because then you can... Yeah. There's more guarantee that they'll still be around in the future. Oh, great, Jojo. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Guys, sorry if we're skipping over your comments. Just say them again. Uh, it's really difficult to read like this. They're tiny. <laughs> um, oh, wow. You're upgrading to 840 watts today. Awesome, yeah. Shane. Good for you. Uh, I think some of the other catamaran YouTubers have 1.6 kilowatt. Yeah. Yeah. But they so, don't have an electric motor. So catamarans yeah. have the real estate for... And they may not have an electric motor, but they do have a lot of electronics. Yeah. Uh, like now, water makers, for instance, which we don't have. Yeah. Oh, one other thing that we didn't mention, but it's a monohull that is our dream boat. Ah, yes. That. Oh, that's so important. Yeah. <laughs> It's a big one. We yeah. just like didn't even think about multi haul because we don't. Yeah, our yeah. dream boat is a mono haul. Um, we've been on a lot of catamarans. They're very comfortable. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. They're uh, they feel like a mansion compared to what we have. However, uh, they're not quite as stable. Well, they're in, super stable in rough weather until they tip. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, when they tip, they're tipped. And uh, like I said in out. the yeah, like I said in the beginning, we're really, really all about safety. And for some people, uh, and some of the styles of cruising people do, catamarans are actually safer. Yeah. Um, but for us, that is not the case. Yeah. So our our personal, we like the monohull. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Wait. Many questions here. I know. So many. I'm loving this. Uh, let's see. Okay, after upgrading the batteries, would you get more power to the prop and be capable of haul speed? My thoughts are in emergencies, power may be helpful. Okay, so actually with the batteries we have, we can get the haul speed for 20 minutes, which is the problem. Uh, <laughs> so more power would let us do haul speed much longer and it'd be nice to go seven and a half knots. Yeah, uh, nice. haul speed for us is seven and well, a half to nine knots. Yeah, so yeah. it's haul speed when we're vertical is seven and a half. Uh, but when, when we heel over, we go 10 knots. Mm -hmm. um, That's, yeah. Let's take a small break and continue on our oh, list yes, before yes, yes. otherwise this video will be Wait, three there's hours There is a question. Long. Aren't you a dentist? I am a dentist. Yes, that yes. is accurate. <laughs> um, okay, so... Wait, there's yeah. one last question here. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. we're, we're that what far What would ahead? you be recommended kilowatt storage for your boat your size? Uh, all right, we currently have, I'm assuming you mean battery power. So we have uh, 10 kilowatts for our motor bank, I think. Yes. Wait, I'm not sure. I, now I don't remember. <laughs> no, yeah, we are. We're I think ten, so. We're, yeah, we're 9.6 kilowatts for the motor, and then the house bank is 500 amps. So... At 12 volt. That is that is our uh, setup. Thanks for your questions, guys. They're yes. really awesome. Okay, so back um, to the... Yeah, so the now we're going to talk about um, a cockpit. Yes. And uh, we've had the question, would you prefer center cockpit or aft cockpit? And we've talked about this a lot. And yeah, we would actually, though center cockpit, I think is really cool and comfortable. And they give you this like great aft state room, which yes. is beautiful. Uh, love it. But. However, <laughs> uh, aft cockpit, um, again, for safety and just staying dry. <laughs> yeah. Mainly. So, okay. So there's two sides to the coin. One thought is if you're aft cockpit, Waves coming in from the back are going to soak you. If you're center cockpit, those waves won't get to you. But the thing is, the waves from the back are usually, you know, following sea. So they don't usually come in. Yeah, they don't usually all. come in. So you're good. But when you're beating is when the spray, like, hits the bow and just, like, whoosh, gets you. So we see a lot of the waves and spray and everything get to, like, the mast and smash our dodger and, like, spray it and all. And it's like, we're really far back, so we don't get hit. Yeah. If we were midship, you get soaked. so. And there are times that. when we've gotten really soaked anyway and would have horrible. been way more soaked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if that were, So, I mean, really. Both, yeah. <laughs> they have their pluses and yeah. minuses. We prefer aft cockpit. Yeah. And Especially for a cutter rig, you kind of have to. 
Yeah. Have the a other app cockpit. Now for single handing, no, they do center. Do they? Yeah, but uh, passports, they're center cockpit. I don't know that I've ever been on a passport. The Ritter. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, the other <laughs> thing for single handing was, for me at least, when I single before Maddie, uh, when you're aft cockpit and you're docking alone. You come in and you're stern to like backing into the slip and you can have the stern line in your hand and be at the helm and like toss things and like that was very convenient. Which I imagine if, so. Yeah. 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 Great. Yes. Um, and that leads us to lines led aft uh, versus lines at the mast. Oh, I am so torn on this one. So am you I. Saw, That's yeah. why I looked at you. <laughs> okay. So, so personally. All right. Well, this is a little spoiler alert. But when we get back to the States, we're going to be rebuilding Windpuff, our Allbird 30. And there's going to be a lot of this stuff in that boat. So your question of, like, why not just get your perfect boat? And it's like... We're going to make our well, perfect we're gonna, boat. We're going to work on it. <laughs> yeah. So for, for ease, it's so convenient to just be in the cockpit and just pull some lines and then yeah. you're done. The problem is the stress that that puts on everything is incredible. And then you have to reinforce things and then things start leaking and this and that versus if they're at the mast where then you have to walk to them, which is inconvenient in that. So like my, well, okay. So my yeah. personal, and I've actually been like daydreaming about this for a couple weeks, uh, is both where you have winches <laughs> at the mast and then just a really long tail to a clutch bank and a winch in the cockpit. So for ease, you can do everything in the cockpit, but if you, you know, you're offshore and you have more time and you're not like in a tight area where it's like quick at the sail up fast and like steer and turn it. Uh, you can go up and work the lines at the mast and you don't have to mess with, you know, the issues of them getting fouled leading back to the cockpit. So I, that is my personal like Yeah, I thought think for daydream. me, I would personally rather have them at the mast. Um, A, because I'm not as handy as Herbie, so I'd worry more about um, if I were single handing, I, it, it's safer to just have them at the mast. Yeah. Um, but B, because honestly, like, and this is very specific to us, but when you're on a very long voyage, it gets super boring and it actually feels really good to have a reason to walk up onto the deck. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I actually really enjoy I feel like I'm doing something a lot more when I actually like physically walk up onto the deck and I'm like adjusting so, lines and stuff. So the reason I'm like so torn on this is I used to single hand this boat and like I'd raise anchor under sail alone. So you'd have you'd have to be running oh back my and God. forth. And that's the yeah, yeah. that's the problem so, with single handing. So getting the sail up would be you start raising the sail yeah. and you like lock the helm. And you get a sail up part way, and, you and then you have the to like, and... yeah, and then you have to like run back to the helm, to like adjust course and adjust the sheets a little, and then run back up, and it's back and forth. We're in the helm; it's like just pull it in, and up it goes. But then, if something gets stuck, you have to go to the mast to fix it. So if your lines are led aft, you're not as familiar with going up on deck, and then going up there when something's broken and those conditions are bad, it's like, where, for me, like I do this in the dark because. I go up there all the time, so it's not... Yeah. <laughs> that one's really hard. It's hard. <laughs> so that's uh... why... I, so my thought is to have the lines led back, but if you're going offshore, take them out of the clutches and everything and just have them coiled up at the mast. I like so that. So you, you have them up there, but then when you're coastal, you can have them at the lead aft. I like that. Thank you. I've been <laughs> daydreaming about this a lot. All right, so... It's what um... I think about... <laughs> we had a quick question about um, doing dentistry abroad, I think. Oh, uh, I don't do dentistry abroad. Wait, that's not where you click. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, oh, I, gosh, there have been a lot. Okay. okay. Well, I don't do dentistry abroad because of work visas and yeah. licensure. So I, you can't, and yeah. yeah, we can't set up a thing where you do dentistry on other sailors because of that reason. We're like, we're never in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and if we were in the U.S., I'm only licensed still Maryland. for Maryland. Yeah. So like... But when yeah. we get back, you're all welcome to come to the practice. Yeah. From Clarksville, Maryland. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hall material. Also, oh. didn't even think about that. Wow, Sorry. Okay. That's great. Fiberglass. Fiberglass for sure. 100% yeah. fiberglass. So much. I love wooden boats. Very low maintenance. But and fiberglass. fiberglass is very easy to fix. Even I can do it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so the question exactly was steel versus fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Steel rusts. That's, that's, that's it. That's like, it. 
I've seen so many boats that like well, probably we have... aluminum if you're going up north though. No, still fiberglass. <sighs> I don't want to go north. It's cold. Well, yeah. But yeah, if, yeah. If you're going north, you should probably do aluminum or metal. Yeah. I'd actually, I honestly, steel versus aluminum. I do steel because steel rusts, aluminum just like disintegrates away, and it, it, that freaks me out. Like we were actually on the hard next to this 80 foot beautiful boat. When they're power watching it, it had like 20 holes in the hull where the aluminum actually just ate through and just bottom paint and sea funk was just like plugging these <laughs> holes up. And when they sprayed it, they had holes in their hull. And I was like, oh, never getting an aluminum boat. So um, that freaks me out. But, and this is actually really exciting. Um, we are having a video series coming out uh, in the future. Yeah. All about hull materials. It's going to be a whole week of discussing hull materials and... It's not just from us. Yeah, so uh, Herbie I actually, actually went and yeah, I interviewed people who are cruising on those hulls. Yeah. So so far, I've interviewed ferro cement, which is actually very interesting. Uh, wood, fiberglass. No, actually, I haven't done fiberglass yet. Uh, <laughs> plywood and aluminum. Yeah. Those are the four that I've done so far. So we're really excited to bring yeah. you guys that. There's uh, a guy series. in this marina with a steel hull, so he might be number five. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see other questions here. Uh, that was a really good question about the hall material. Thanks for that. Teak decks. Oh, oh deck material. Deck. Uh, paint <sighs> with non-skid. The for, teak. Yeah, yeah, aesthetically teak. I think they is the most beautiful. beautiful. I always get jealous oh, of people yeah. with teak decks. But they but are so hot. They're to walk so hot. On. <laughs> I just, I, I we can't. Go, uh, yeah. We go, we mainly are barefoot. All and the time. So and it's just really hot. And also there are a lot of maintenance to keep that beautiful. Yeah. And then the other thing, like now I completely understand why the whole boat shoe business, because yeah. you cannot go barefoot on those things. Yeah. They hurt. Beauty so, is pain. Yeah. So white and non-skid. None of this like blue stuff. Because yeah. That definitely, is hot. Definitely white just because yeah. it keeps your cabin cooler as well. Yes. 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 Um, I... It's it's difficult because I really do think teak decks are absolutely beautiful, and I love colors. So when you have a, a blue deck or something like that, I go crazy. I really love it. But, to look at. But just uh, <laughs> if you're long term cruising, yeah, uh, like we are, it's best to just do white um, because of that. And there was one guy I met that he had you know the white deck, and then he painted non skid and like blue patches, and it was hilarious because he would like tiptoe on the non nod skid parts that were still white because he couldn't physically touch the blue. It but was it, it looked so really hot. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I would want white with nut skin. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness, you're very passionate about uh, that. Yeah, that one really <laughs> got yeah, that's a big one for me. <laughs> <laughs> Never know what'll hit my button. <laughs> uh so thank you, Shane, for bringing that to our attention. Thank you for the first person who asked that. Uh steel rust from the inside, hard to find. Hmm, that's a good point. Okay, so why metal... Okay, Why so, steel in the Arctic versus glass? Okay, yeah. so metal in the Arctic because every uh, icebreakers tend to be metal boats and everyone that goes north always does it in a metal boat and everyone who, everyone says you need metal. I have no interest in going that far north, so I haven't looked into it more than is we're, ice We're mostly there. going off of uh, people who know more than we do on that topic. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> my concern with fiberglass is... The whole issue when you're... So I lived aboard in Baltimore and the water would freeze in the harbor. And everyone... It was a big issue to like keep the ice away from the hall because they're like, oh, the ice will like croach in and then crack your hall. Mm -hmm. So if that's stationary ice, imagine hitting ice. So that's why I was like, eh. Shane says uh, that his cream kiwi grip is always cool to the touch. And Ooh, actually, we, Shane, kiwi grip is yeah. on my ultimate boat. Yeah, we I recently, love kiwi grip. Yeah, we met someone with kiwi grip that was I was so jealous. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our, we have the non-skid um, powder. Interlux intergrip powder. Yeah. And it's fine, but kiwi grip is way better. Yeah. Why? Dex supremacy? <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cold mode. Oh, uh, Okay. Uh, cold molded boats. Uh, I highly recommend reading the book The Hall by Larry Party, where he goes into building a wooden boat, which may he rest in peace. Yes. Uh, but at the very end, he talks about cold molded boats, and it's very bad. It's, uh, yeah, they can be beautiful, and they, or actually, mm. correction, they're always beautiful looking boats, but they can 
have a horrible and early death. Paul asked about synthetic rigging on a large catamaran. That brings yeah. us back to our rigging discussion, but absolutely that is possible and I would recommend it. Yeah, actually, so gunboats come standard with synthetic rigging and they're big cats. Carbon fiber. Thoughts? Uh, for So for mast, I think they're awesome. They're, you know, reduce your weight aloft. And carbon fiber with synthetic is actually a great combination because the whole issue we have of when it gets cold and the rigging goes slack. So what happens is aluminum actually contracts and then the synthetic rigging elongates, it expands. So then you get slack rigging. Carbon fiber moves less severely or changes shape less severely with temperature than aluminum does. So your rigging won't get as out of tune. So that. So, <laughs> yes. Now, but, but carbon <laughs> fiber is incredibly expensive. So I personally want to. Hello, do it. Felix. <laughs> um, so getting back to our, oh, DIY synthetic with lashing. Well, so I'd have lashings and a turnbuckle, or sorry, I'd have lashings and a dead eye just to make making the rigging easier because you don't have to be as precise. Like the head stays are tricky to make because they're like to the millimeter, they have to be exact. Uh, then the turnbuckles below that to make life easier. So a, a combination, yes. Um, so we're going to move now to some more nitpicky things about our... Uh, um. Oh, thanks, Patrick. Yes. <laughs> uh, about our uh, our ultimate cruising boat. And yes. the big thing is, especially for Herbie, he's very passionate about this, but I agree that it would be really nice to have is a bowsprit. Yep. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. We, we... <laughs> nice long bowsprit. Yeah. It puts the sail further out, and yeah. then the boat gets pulled along. Yeah. And it's, it's very nice. It's It would be great to have. And it also gives you a longer sparred length, so then a longer sail plan, but you don't have... Sorry, dude, that is just not nice. And you're distracting me. <laughs> but, yeah, so, uh, yeah. The, it gives you a longer sparred length, and it just puts the sails further out, but you don't have all the added weight of putting a boat out there. So then you get more sail area with less weight. Um, and now, and then the boomkin and, boomkin? Bumpkin? Bump, well, Bump. <laughs> yeah, so, With I've called it bumpkin, uh, and I've heard boomkin and bumpkin, but yes, depends where you're I from. prefer boomkin. <laughs> Country bumpkin back there. <laughs> yeah, so a bumpkin, or boomkin, is pretty much a bowsprit of the stern, so it's a stern sprit. But, so, the reason for the bumpkin is then you can mount your stern anchor in there, and then you have a very good place to mount your stern anchor, which is super important. You need a bow anchor and a stern anchor. And my idea would be a stern anchor windlass. And the bow anchor windlass to be electric <laughs> with a manual backup. I would love an electric windlass. Yeah. That is like huh. very high when, on my list. Yeah, when we're on those other boats, it's like, put the anchor around. It's like, boop. And then put <laughs> the anchor up. It's like, boop. And it just comes up. Yeah. So nice. I mean, I yeah. have... I have aided in the getting up the anchor but honestly like it's yeah. mostly herbie's job and yeah it's rough like it's so rough i have painted marks on the chain just to, to like, give you just, hope yeah it's like, like i'm almost there keep cranking <laughs> it's just oh yeah um, so electric would yeah. be so nice nathan says how heavy is your anchor well, the anchor is 65 pounds we currently actually have our ultimate anchor uh, yeah that is one thing that we set out to do. get and we got it it is the mantis 65 pound yep and it's fabulous yeah we put it down <laughs> and we are good we're good yeah. in any conditions really no rock but yeah yeah we just <laughs> don't anchor in rock is what we do mm -hmm. yeah but like how everyone's like oh you have to put your anchor down and then like you know rev it to so much in reverse and all this stuff it's like no yeah just put it down it's done it's it's got it <laughs> but yeah it's it's an awesome anchor so, um, Mantis Anchor. Yes. Uh, we were actually talking about Mantis Anchor for the stern anchor as well, or not. Because we currently have a fortress for the back. And it would be nice, but it's nice also to have an anchor that's really good for sand and mud. And only in one direction. Because the problem with a fortress anchor is if there's a tide shift, they dig in so well, and then the aluminum shank just bends. Which is why we use it in tandem with the Mantis, so yeah. we're not shifting mm -hmm. with the tides. Yeah, Mantis first, and then yeah. the fortress as the second anchor in a Bahamian mooring. Yeah. Um, boat size. 
Oh, so that's one where we've had some... All right, so why don't we just get our perfect boat? We can't decide what it is. <laughs> uh, so the boat size for me that is... All right, I'm just going to block this dude. It's being a turd. How do, you, how do you do this? How do you block somebody? I don't know. Ah, all right. Well, it's okay. Um... So the, the the boat size that would be best for me is 45 feet. Uh, or bigger. Or bigger. I wouldn't want to go a lot bigger because it becomes a lot to handle. And yeah. the criteria for us, especially since we're sailing as the two of us, is that if any one of us got hurt, the other one would have to be able to single hand. And so I wouldn't want to go much bigger than 45 because single handing a 45 for me is already um, a little bit daunting. Though I can do it. For Herbie, he prefers something smaller because he's the one who actually has to I'm do the work. I'm fixing and cleaning. Yeah. And yeah. So it's like on our size. Well, okay. Our main and head sail are both 400 and change square feet. Like they're big sails. Our stay sail is 180 feet. Now the like pull, I, I can literally go up and like 20 knots of wind and just grab the clue of the stay sail and just pull it by hand. And it'll come with me because I gave it a yank. I pull the head sail and I will do a pull up because the <laughs> sail's not going to move. So it's like stuff like that, like smaller than all the loads are less and mm -hmm. just everything's just easier. In terms of cost, it makes sense to go smaller because everything oh. costs less when yeah. you have a smaller boat. It's just how it yeah. is. Okay, sails so, are cost less. The lines cost less. Yeah. Everything. So rigging wise, like yeah. to re-rig our boat, which is 45 feet and synthetic cost $4,400 in materials. To re-rig the Auberg, it's about $600. So that's a huge, huge difference. Um, but for cruising and living on the boat full-time for years on end, we've lived on this boat for eight years now, Yeah. Uh, I would not go smaller than 45. Yeah, for, for the, <laughs> like, living long-term, yeah. Because yeah. we... So while we were crossing to the Azores multiple times, we're like, man, imagine if we did this in the wind puff and the Auberg 30, and we're like... Phew be rough because like for just yeah for the, the just one of, crossing yeah. it would be fine but the fact is we're living on this for full time full time for years yeah. and then when we got to the azores a couple days later someone came in on an alberg 30 and we were like oh that's tiny wow, it's <laughs> small. so that yeah suzanne and you are going with 42 that's, that's an excellent yeah. size 42 is a fantastic size yeah so actually hello so fraser my, fraser like, when, before I bought this boat, the boat I was like heavily looking at was the Island Packet 38, and it's actually 42 feet, I think, overall. Something. It's, yes, it's a very nice size. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and our ultimate boat, I think, would be a little beamier. Um, the thing is, you it's give and take, because for living in, I would want it to be beamier. But for sailing full time and cruising, especially yeah. in heavy weather, it's way better to be... What we have is 11 feet. Yeah. Um, so, the, so the issue is when you get beamier, then you can fall farther when you heal really far. Mm -hmm. Like you physically can yeah. fall further. And like I've had times when I've actually walked on the side because the boat was over about 40 degrees. So it was horrible. And it's like it was still doable. Uh, he asks if we're rich. And the answer is very much no. <laughs> yeah, we're very not We are rich. not rich, which is why we don't have many of the things we're talking about today. <laughs> yeah, that's why the dream. Uh, there's another question of cutter versus catch for, uh, for well, our opinion. Yeah. Cutter because one mast. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah. You still have three sails? Uh, buying second-hand equipment for lower costs? Absolutely. Yes, we yeah. do that a, a lot. A lot of our boat is second-hand. Yeah. There's a, if you're near Annapolis, there's this place called Bacon. Everything yeah. is super cheap there. Is there a big different uh, comfort difference between 38, 40, and 42 feet? The difference in comfort is in the weight of the boat. Right. So the heavier boat, like if the 38 is heavier than the 42, the 38 would be more comfortable at sea. Oh, thanks, Johnny. That's nice of you to say. He enjoys our videos. <laughs> oh, we're back. And we're back. Yeah. Okay, okay, excellent. So... On with the uh, more I'd stuff. love an Amel 46. That's awesome. Amels are really beautiful yes. boats. They sail okay. really beautifully. So Amel, they're designed to be the ultimate cruising boat. But the thing, is, like the catch to them is they run on diesel. So as long as you are cool with that, then 
they are so nice. They have like all these accessories mm -hmm. and like all that, but they just, it needs diesel. Yeah. Um, Johnny Hag, yes, 37 footer is a great size for single handing. Nice. Yeah. Um, outboards mounted oh. through cockpit sole and through yeah. the transom? Question mark. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't like that. I've seen it. I, I'm just not a fan. Cause my, my, <laughs> all right, so uh, one was actually on an Allberg 30. Uh, I think it's Adam Voyagers or something. He, he cut a hole in the aft lazarette and mounted the outboard in there. So now he has a gas engine that's supposed to be run in a large open ventilated area in a small space. So it's like the whole boom, boom factor. And then <laughs> the other part is he made this like really cool, like blades that like close it off and all. But if there's an issue that fills up with water and the Lazarus, a big thing to be full of water. I just, I'm, I like as few holes as possible. Mm. Yes, I agree. Um, Patrick so, is asking, what about the galley? Good question. What would you change there? I ask because I love to cook. I love okay. to cook too. And the I, galley I is very important. So my big change to the galley is that the galley drain through hole not be below the water line. So it would go into a tank that would then be pumped out above the water line. Cause that is, That's it's a big hole. Now the Amels have this and everyone hates it because it dumps into the bilge and then it stinks. So <laughs> my thought on that is have it into a little box with a little like rural water pump just pumps it out and then at the bottom to a manual pump that'll like you know Thanks, flow Caesar. the bits of chicken and broccoli that have you know gone down the drain so that way smell isn't an issue mm -hmm. that's my thought um as for our galley honestly there isn't a lot i would change physically about it um i love the top loading fridge yeah that's really big for me because yeah. it allows us to hold lots of food and keep lots of food frozen for and, extended periods of time for long crossings. And if it's rough and you open it, <clears throat> nothing falls out. Exactly. That's you can open it huge. on either tack. Yeah. Um, I also love the gimbling oven. We've kind of worked to make our yeah, galley, galley we've done. as... <laughs> as uh, perfect as we could. I mean, obviously I could always use more counter space, oh, but... <laughs> okay, here's the thing. So we have the single big sink that we like, yeah. but it has a drain on one side. So on the other tack, it, it doesn't, doesn't drain. drain. Two so drains would two be two drains nice. would be nice, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just put a light in my top loading fridge. It's a game changer, Ooh. I'll bet. That's, I, that's excellent. I like that idea. Yeah, sometimes we just use our phones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you need to be sent some red hair coloring? Actually, it works on you. Oh, thank you, Peter. I have stocked up. Yes. <laughs> uh, would you flush your toilet with your kitchen wastewater? We actually uh, have a uh, oh, well, yeah, I, composting I, I, toilet. So if we had a flushing toilet, yeah. we wouldn't because then you get grease and stuff. In it. No. But the... Uh, and you, you could get like little bits of food stuck and yeah it'd it just be just, it'd yeah. look like someone threw up in your toilet every time you flush <laughs> but the uh we have a compost toilet and that's actually on our list yeah. is compost toilet because um, they are great yeah our head is also something that we have worked really hard on to make into our ultimate cruising boat head and yeah. it does include the composting toilet which we love yep um it doesn't it, like direct discharge we kind of like that's kind of a no-no for us because it's bad for the environment. Um, and a holding tank, there's a whole mess, literally, oh. of things that can go wrong with a holding and, tank. And if you want fun stories, ask any boater about a head horror story. And, yeah. Oh, my God. There's this one where, like, a hose slipped off and it literally covered the entire engine in poop. <laughs> 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 So gross. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, yeah, our boat had electrosan too. Yeah, we, before, we had electrosan and, yeah. and we took it out. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just so much less maintenance, honestly. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bucket yeah. that has dirt in it. <laughs> you have to be willing to handle some things. Yeah. That's the only thing. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. so that's that. Well, wait, 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 wait. So we didn't finish the boat size. Oh, so we didn't finish that? We didn't finish the boat size. Okay. So here's the thing. If you do like 30 to 40 foot is where I think for boat and then spars longer so bumpkin and bowsprit you end up with you know closer to 50 foot for your sail plan so you have the sails to carry you big heavy boat so it's comfortable and livable interior but the maintenance isn't so much to clean because that's all i've been doing since we got here 
Oh yeah. It's just that's all like, we ever do. Yeah, it, it's like <laughs> like I never clean everything. Like I'm never done. Yeah. I just do like, hey, I'm gonna do the port bow today, and I just like scrub that, and then another day I'll do the starboard bow, and then I have you know midship part, and it's 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 a lot to clean. So yeah. less to clean would be nice. Oh, see you, Mike. Thanks for coming in. Um, oh yeah, David's got a horror story. One less hold hold to fill. That is absolutely correct. Um, so we, uh, oh, you were just talking about the deck. Um, so yes. flat wide decks would yeah. be optimal for us. Yeah. So the, actually, so our Alberg has the like typical big cabin top thing and a mm -hmm. narrow deck and I hate well, walking on that. Well, it's difficult cause you just, it's when, small boat. yeah, you trip around it and it's just hard. You kind of have to like shimmy across like this. Yeah. Um, and so it is, I think, yeah, the, the perfect cruising boat. We've seen some that like the deck is completely flat, flush, and that is oh, it's so nice, quite nice, yeah. so nice. And then they're also teak, yeah. and it's beautiful. Yeah, but... <laughs> they're always teak when that's the case, and oh, it's so nice. Uh, our current deck is oh yeah. Uh, question: It was boom kicker, topping lift, or stack pack and in mass filling. Okay, so not in mass filling. I don't like stack packs because they're just they're there and they're in the way on the boom. Uh, I personally like. Uh, lazy jacks and just sail ties and then put a sail bag over it. Lazy it's, jacks can be really annoying. But oh, they're the most annoying thing. We've on learned our that setup. they're kind of worth it. Yeah, but like, yeah, like our setup, the worst part is the lazy jacks. They're yeah. annoying, but that's it. Like, there's nothing. There's no cloth in the way. Nothing getting like torn and all that. Uh, where the stack pack, it's always in the sun, so it's you know, dying every day. And then the other one was the boom kicker or topping lift. I like topping lifts because. Uh, I, I don't like boom kickers. I don't know what a boom kicker it's, is. <laughs> uh, it's a fixed stick that holds your boom up. Oh. So, and it also doubles as a vang. Like, it's it's oh. nice. They're very nice. We don't have a vang. We don't have a vang. Uh, but the nice thing about a topping lift is you can put the boom anywhere you want, and it's just easy to adjust, and mm -hmm. I just, I like it. And then the other part of a topping lift is it is a spare halyard if your main halyard breaks. Yeah. You just pop it over to it. We have so. spares for everything. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, so, so flat wide decks. Flat wide decks, wooden interior. That's just aesthetic. Yeah, that's we like nothing. wood. We just really like yeah. wood. Uh, and then this is something we <laughs> don't have, but both like, but both don't want to put on our boat because we don't like the way they look. <laughs> <laughs> is a hard dodger. It's true. Yeah. They, I, uh, hard dodgers are fantastic, but I oh. just don't like the way they look. Yeah. But honestly, my ideal cruising yacht would have one. Oh, mine too. Yes, because <laughs> I just don't want to put one on wisdom. <laughs> yeah, and if we did, I'd do it in wood. Yeah. Or paint it white. It's, Something. So yeah. it's heavier, you know. Uh, it, yeah. But but uh, but when you take a nasty pelting wave, that's the thing. They're yeah. so nice. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for it's, we have a pretty small cockpit, so. A hard dodger wouldn't be like a horrible giant thing you know it would just yeah i i really love be nice yeah <laughs> and it's funny so all right this is a thing so n first boat buyers never want a hard dodger because they're ugly and i same like i was like no, no it's ugly i don't want that and then like people who have had a boat a long time Not and like too really sailed far they all, those are the ones that do the hard dodger and they're mm -hmm. like i don't care what it looks like they're great and they're great. Um, uh, what do you think of Pearson boats? And we like Pearsons. Yeah. Yeah. Pearsons are great boats. Though, uh, there's a YouTube channel that has a Pearson and it keeps breaking on them. So it could be their fault though. It could, yeah. So it's like, look, I mean, get a survey. Yeah. That's like, the big thing. <laughs> get a survey and get a boat that doesn't yeah. have problems because, yeah. But I mean, I don't think any boat is too old. No. And this one. The older boats are built more strong. The, the so. way to view it is if you have a brand. All right. You have two boats. One is brand new and one is 99 years old. Which one is probably going to make it to 100 years of age? <laughs> so it's like you can look at it as like it's really old, but you can also look at it as that's the boat that's lasted. Yeah. The newer boats just aren't built to last. Um, oh, yeah. Not all of them. Yeah. Some of them are depends. really yeah. good. Uh, yeah, you just have to do your homework on that one. Yep. Uh, is oh. there a good resource for what years and boat brands have a full slash long keel and solid blue water hull? Yes. Uh -huh. It's called bluewaterboats.com or .org. I 
can't remember which, but that website has like all the really good boats on it. Oh, that's another thing that's not on this. Not a cord haul. Solid fiberglass. No coring. Oh, yeah. Because that mm. coring freaks me out. Yeah, we should have mentioned that in the whole design. Oh, I love gossards. Are they yeah. fast? Uh, I do not know if they're fast, <laughs> but they're beautiful. They have the bowsprit. They have a clipper bow, which I think is just so pretty. They're full keel. <sighs> yeah, gossards are nice. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did we yes. talk about the boom gallows? Oh, we did not. Okay. We should talk about the boom gallows. A boom gallow, because <laughs> I like them. Hey, Jim. So, so a boom gallow is, instead of a topping lift, you have this, like, gallow where you could either hang mutiny crew, or you could also <laughs> just mount your boom. Why'd you look at me when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the whole thing is, when we aren't using our main and we're using our trisel, the main is just like, meep, meep. And at anchor, it's just like scooting around so and it's really loud. annoying. It's like, yeah. so boom gallo has these little troughs in it and the boom sits in it and stays put and stops wiggling around and it's quiet. And so that's one reason. <laughs> the other reason is for the chest high lifelines. So ours go from the stern rail up to our shrouds and it's diagonal. So when you come out of the cockpit, it's kind of low. It's like the height of a regular lifeline. But then when you get further up, then it's nice and high. At a boom gallo, you can have it parallel so you have you know the bottom lifeline the top lifeline and then your chest high lifeline yeah we have a lot of lifelines <laughs> yeah safety first we really <laughs> like living yeah and staying alive <laughs> yeah so yeah that oh another thing with the anchor we didn't mention mm. is the uh a captive anchor holder so our boat originally just had this like thing that holds the anchor and in really heavy weather the anchor just pops out and did oh, a number yeah. on our head stay and stuff. Uh, we so, had one made. We had a... Yeah, so we, we've had, like, stuff done to make this one better. Yeah. But it would be really nice to have, like, say, mounted on the side of a bowsprit, a nice, you know, you have the roller and then a flange of metal. So the anchor comes in and out and the chain can't go anywhere. And it's, it's good. Yeah, it yes. is. <laughs> yep. Uh, oh. Wind steering. We didn't talk about... Oh, wind steering, guys. Yes. No auto, no electric autopilot yeah, business. Yeah, our wind steering. Yeah, we would um, definitely, absolutely, one hundred percent suggest that the entire world of sailing gets wind steering. No, no good wind steering. Yeah, not like certain brands. That so are, we have a monitor. Yeah, so and you, it's been wonderful. Yeah, so not pushing brands here, but a servo pendulum wind steering, which is monitor Aries. And those are the only two that I know. There might be more. But... Hydrovane question mark? Yeah, that's the one that I wouldn't do. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> if you already have one, then that's, that's you fine. Have, that's, but... you know, they do work. Yeah, it's just like in really heavy weather, a monitor will... It's just, just a little bit more reliable. Work. Yeah. Yeah, it's in... So in the instructions from Hydrovane... Now, this is five years old. This is when I was looking at doing this. The Hydrovane's instructions said, if the weather gets really nasty, turn on your electric autopilot to help. It's like, eh. <laughs> oh, if you don't have one yet, yeah, don't don't get a Hydrovane. Seriously. like, And then the whole, mount it anywhere you want. Put them on the side. I've seen people, they're sailing, and uh, I get heated on this. But yeah, it's <laughs> monitor. Um, monitor is Aries. fantastic. Yeah, like, like a servo pendulum, like a proper wind vane. You can also make your own. You can. Uh, but... If you're really good. Yeah, at it, they're if tricky. you really trust yourself. So I was going to, and then I mm -hmm. read a book about how to make self steering systems, and then I cheated a little and looked at monitors. I was like, hee hee, I'll just like replicate theirs. And I was reading all the changes they've done through the years, and it's like tiny little tweaks to make it better and better and better, and like keep working. I'm like, oh my god, how many versions have they gone through? So we just bought our monitor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, though. Okay. So so, and want monitor to be used in as emergency, an emergency rudder. rudder. Yes. You can because if you lock off the control lines, then the paddle is stuck and then it works as an emergency rudder. Yes. It's it works it's then. It's small, you yeah. know. It's not so going to like They do sell an adapter that they call the M rudd, which is a bigger paddle, and when it's in that configuration, it then works like a hydrovane, which works okay. Not not the greatest. So it's like eh. Yeah. How often should a mast be replaced? Ideally, never. Yeah. But you replace it for if it's having issues. So if you have buckling or if uh, 
the if you have severe uh galvanic corrosion and like literally it's like just bubbling out and the paint's just flaking off yeah yeah uh, <laughs> but otherwise I masks mean, are built to last they well hopefully yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, okay, after cruise slash coastal skipper VHF. Uh, oh, we did not mention radio and AIS. Oh, I would do our radio and AIS. Uh, I will do again. This is why we love you guys. Thanks yeah. for bringing up all this awesome stuff. Yes, yeah, so we have the um, Standard Horizon with AIS receiver. Yeah, we did. Then, we actually asked the YouTube community about which AIS to get, and that yeah. was the best decision we could have made. Yes. Um, we, did, uh, we got the Vesper Marine XB... 8,000, 8, I think, it's, with the antenna yeah. splitter. Mm -hmm. It's right over there. But And it's been <laughs> Fantastic. so good. Like, Especially in the Mediterranean, you. because the med, the med is very highly trafficked, and it's hard to control your our boat in the med sometimes since, uh, again, electric motor. Yeah. And, well, when we were leaving Gibraltar. <laughs> and the winds are, are very fluky there. <laughs> we took three days to get 40 miles to finally make it out of the grasp of the current because yeah. the current kept sucking us back in. Yes. So and having AI transmitting AIS yeah. was a godsend at yeah, that point. Yeah, because we're like in the middle of shipping in the Strait of Gibraltar. And we would see them just avoid us. They it go was, around. Oh, it was, it was amazing. So nice. Yeah. Oh, we do not have the NMEA 2000. Well, I had it for our old autopilot and I've removed it because I just don't do the electronics. Yeah, we had an um, electric autopilot that we tried out and it it was not good for many reasons that we've gone through in especially yes. our uh, and everyone said we should have gotten raymarine yeah. like now it's like okay yeah <laughs> but we really like monitor yeah we do the wind vane again a, in a heartbeat yeah. and just yeah and we're i mean we're just not set up to draw that much power honestly so yeah it's yeah uh Oh, good. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Shane. Oh, okay. Uh, so the wind gen all right, the question is wind generator at the top of a mast, uh, my opinion. So no. So yes and no. If For power, <laughs> yes, because you're getting it in higher wind speeds and it's going to do more. The no is because you're putting all that weight super high up there. And then any issues that it has, you have to go all the way up your mast to fix it. Maintenance. And yeah, it's just... And you're going to heal more. Um, yeah, it's just more weight aloft. And yeah. the whole goal is to reduce weight aloft and then... But honestly, um, and we have heard a few wind gens that were really nice. Yeah. Uh, like, that you couldn't even hear. They were so quiet. Mostly wind gens... Uh, they are, do this. Yeah. And all the time. We just prefer solar. Yeah. But, I, but if we had to run more stuff... On our boat, we probably would have a wind generator because we, we just don't have very many electronics aboard. Yeah. Oh, so that's another thing. In this list, there's really no electronics that we talked about. Yeah, you about. may have meant, noticed that we never talked about, like, a water maker, for instance, um, or chart plotters. Or and, any stuff. Yeah, and like, that's because they would not be on our ideal boat. Yeah, I, they're, they cost thousands of dollars, and then... They just... <sighs> well, water makers, yeah. um, everybody we know with water makers, uh, the maintenance is constant. Uh, yeah. The other thing is we just carry so much water, and I suppose our ideal boat would carry a lot of water for yes. that reason. Oh, a lot of water yeah. and in multiple tanks. That's that's another thing. Yeah. Not all in one tank. Cause, uh, actually, so on that Nordhaven and also on Katie Krogan's and all, they carry like 300 or so gallons of water, which is great. But in one single tank. So it's like if that gets contaminated, you lost all your water. Yeah. So that's... Uh, yeah. Have you seen much use of kite sails? I have Silent seen... Silent yachts have them as an option. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've seen the kite sails, but I've never met anyone that actually has used one. <laughs> so they, they seem cool, but I wonder if it's just kind of gimmicky. I imagine that they would be used on more light displacement well, So the, the whole idea is... So it's like for transatlantic, like what we're about to do, like, you know, crossing the Atlantic the easy way, you just put it up and then you don't have to do any other sales. It just carries you. And it's great. But it's like, I'm just looking at it, like if that thing goes in the water and you're not looking because you don't have to look because it does it on its own, like just, yeah, it just, I, I don't like free flying sails. Like our drifter or light air sail is, is stayed. stayed. Like everything is hooked on somehow and the one sail we have that's not stayed we just 
don't use. It's our lighter main. It's uh, ripstop nylon, so spinnaker cloth. We've mainsail. used it a couple of times in the doldrums, but it's just not worth the effort to put it on. Yeah, honestly. it's so. If you're it, in yeah. that light of weather, just relax and eat some cheese because you're not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it is Kaisa, a very interesting it's, concept. It's awesome. Like, I like it, but I wouldn't want it, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> we just need to, like, see uh, more of them in action. Honestly. So the question of, do we wish we had a diesel? No. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. That one is big. We talked and, about that earlier at length. Uh, um, yeah. And I know some people have come in since then, uh, so we won't go into it all again, but the short answer is no, we really do prefer our electric motor for our style of yeah, sailing. Yeah, we would like more batteries. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> not a diesel. Yeah. Diesels are smelly. Yeah. <laughs> and loud. <laughs> and grass. Ew. They're also They're really... They're oily. Yeah. Yeah. When we were on those other boats, like, I was always in the engine room working. Like, yeah. just little things would break. It's like, like, geez. <laughs> How are you boat. getting this pretty consistent network while cruising? Ah, Okay. SIM cards. Yep. Every country we go to, we so we bought unlocked phones when we left the States. When we get somewhere, we just put in a SIM card in that country. So the one we currently have in Portugal, oh, in Madeira, is uh, 15 days of unlimited internet, which is how we're streaming right now. Um, <laughs> since YouTube is our entire job, uh, we really do rely heavily on the networks yeah and so we are on 4g right now we're on 4g yeah. yeah i i hope it's good for you guys i it's <laughs> it's hard to tell because we get especially when the phones are in the cabin we don't get very good signal but um yeah it's we have to constantly find restaurants with wi-fi usually when yeah we're, and when we are at sea, we have videos that have been made already and they're scheduled out so the unfortunate thing is we can't respond to comments uh, as diligently as we like to when we're at sea, but yeah, and then we always issues, get to them at some point. Like when we're in Gibraltar, there the like restaurant Wi-Fi was just pitiful, mm -hmm. and internet was like super expensive on a card, so it was really. There was one time was we were in a bar for six hours just uploading one video. Yeah. So. Oh, <laughs> sail material. So that is one thing. So all right. So for mainsail, battenless with a tides marine track. Because mm. that's the, the little, they just go up super fast and easy and like they just, they slide. They never get stuck. So that is yeah. awesome. We had a Batten main before oh. and it was really beautiful, but it yeah. was so annoying. The Battens <laughs> get hooked on everything. everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Battenless, because you can raise a thing on any tack and then no headboard, uh, three reefs and really, really thick, heavy Dacron. That's the, the thing. And then with the Hank on head sails with reef points in them. That way you can reef those as well. Yeah, which we pretty much never do, but sometimes we reef our jib. Yeah, the jib we've been reefing. Like, out in the ocean, yeah. there's good wind. You want the sail, but you don't want that much, so you put a reef in it. Hey, guys. Um, since we're kind of nearing the end, I just want to remind you, if you are enjoying this video, please do hit that like button. It helps with the algorithm a lot. And if you haven't subscribed definitely do oh yeah because we have on our channel we do two types of videos on uh, every sunday we put out a regular episode and every every now and then we put out midweek episodes that are just completely educational and herbie the how to stuff yeah. yeah herbie knows the things <laughs> the technical things yeah. <laughs> um oh thanks i see those likes going up already that's awesome guys thank you so much uh, this has been really fun. I do want to just mention Thanks, a couple Tim. things that, uh, a couple things about wisdom and just talk about how like our boat currently fits some of the molds we've been talking about, but yeah. not all of them. Uh, for instance, wisdom is a heavy displacement full keel cutter. And those three things are really important to us. And so we are biased a little bit, <laughs> but well, the thing is, all right, when I was looking to buy a boat, I wanted long overhangs, full keel, cut a rig, and heavy displacement. Uh, yeah. So the reason that she has those things is because those are like the, the must needs. Yeah. And yeah. They, they were the priority. Um, yeah. And the rest I figured I can, you know, change yeah. and work. And, but some things like adding a bowsprit, sometimes you need spousal approval for that. There's just never a good time. 
<laughs> we, when we get back to the States, he can add a bow for it. Yeah. <laughs> Hemp sales and rigging. Uh, I'm... Nah, I, yes, for, for people that want to be super traditional, they can do hemp rigging. But Dyneema is much better than hemp <laughs> for rigging. <laughs> it's just the, sh the load oh, that they can okay. hold. Okay, so what is the advantage of long overhangs? So a couple things, and then... Uh, oh, other super quick question. There was a, when were we doing videos on rig conversion? And I actually... I'm almost done with a little series where when we redid our heads, the inner force day, where we switched it from steel to synthetic, I filmed everything, like measuring, cutting, installing, splicing. That kind of thing doing... is better not as a live video because we can actually show you. Yeah. So yeah. that 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 is coming. Yeah. I'm almost done with that series. <laughs> but the... Oh, my brain went away. Oh, I knew that would happen. I was going to hold on to it for you, too. What was it? I don't know. Ah, crap. <laughs> Uh, tempted to smoke my rigging. <laughs> I don't understand that one. <laughs> if you could elaborate on what smoking rigging would mean. Oh, yeah, with the bowsprit. Yes, so that's the thing. You, the issue with having bowsprit and stuff is then you have to pay for that extra footage, mm -hmm. but you can just hoist them up. Just, you know, ease the bone, the... Oh, overhangs. Thank you, oh, guys. I knew you, you would help us. <laughs> yes. Okay, so why the overhangs? <laughs> All right, so this is childish. But when I was a kid, I saw this model of a sailboat, and it had long overhangs, and I thought that was pretty. And then when I decided <laughs> I wanted to buy a sailboat, I was looking at sailboats, and they all have the reverse transom where they're like, you know, the bow's this way and the stern's this way, and they look like, you know, bricks with off cuts. And I was like, no, that's not what a sailboat looks like. They're supposed to have the overhangs. So I, that's why, like, I just find the overhang aesthetically pleasing. Now, I would have a small stern on the boat because mm -hmm. a big, like a sugar scoop and all that, it's, you take a huge falling wave and it hits that and it's going to, like, push the boat with a lot of force. Where ours, with that long overhang, at like, we've had... Really big waves come we behind just, us. We just and they just kind of get right swallowed up. underneath, yeah. and it's really cool actually. Uh, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> if they're huge, <laughs> they do come over. They come over, but it's like just like just a little bit. It, yeah, it splashes yeah. in, and like you're like eh, droplets, <laughs> but that's it. It was like a twenty foot wave, and you took a couple drops on you. Like it's yeah. really nice, and the boat doesn't get pushed. So I for comfort, I yeah. would say overhangs are great. Um, yeah, in heavy seas, which we are in a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Now, uh, Sail friend... Oh, that's a good one. Uh, what sailing books are on your recommended reading list? Ooh. All of the parties books. Yeah. So um, the cost conscious cruiser, the self sufficient cruiser, sailing uh, storm, oh, storm tactics. tactics, super. Uh, and then I also like boat building books because if riggers you know, apprentice. Yeah, riggers apprentice is just mandatory. <laughs> uh, but the boat building books, they if you know how it's built. Then you can A, fix it when it breaks, and B, you know why it broke because, yeah. you know. And also, what it's designed to take. So I, Yeah, when you read nice. books about, like, boat design and you understand how the boats are constructed and why they're constructed that way, yeah, it's, you're already ahead of the curve when it comes to safety yeah, and now, being able to fix things yourself. Now, reading a book like that doesn't make you a naval architect. Like, those guys are... Like, <laughs> They are naval architects. You just understand why they do the things that they already know how to do. <laughs> That's pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, agree on boat building and design. Excellent. Yes. Do you do the long overhangs add to usable LWL? Load water line. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. When you heal when over you heal. and sail. Mm -hmm. so, and that's actually what this boat was built for specifically. Yeah, so we have a 10-foot overhang in the stern, which is... <laughs> A little ridiculous, but so we're our length on deck is forty six feet, and our water line is thirty two feet. The rest is hanging out. <laughs> so yeah, and so that's the big thing. So when our theoretical haul speed for the boat at thirty two foot water line is like five and a half or six knots, it's pretty. You got low. it, Dave. But then <laughs> when you actually start getting speed, you get the bow wave and the stern wave and all, and it like rides up on the stern a bit, and we've. With the motor, we have gotten up to seven and a half knots, like on flat going straight where we're not healed. So it's mm -hmm. just the water 
riding up the stern. And when we've been towed, we've been towed at eight knots. But yeah. there we were like, you know, being pulled by a tugboat that was yanking us along. It was also but, terrifying. Yeah. But then <laughs> the uh, when we're sailing, there was one time we we're doing about six knots. And we had the, sh the sails eased. And there was good wind and we could have gone faster. So then we just like sheeted in just to make the boat heal. And we just like kicked it up to nine knots. Yeah. So it's... Thing is, our boat doesn't heal as much as it was meant to because of the synthetic rigging. It's much lighter. Yeah. So we don't heal. We used to heal over like twenty degrees normally. And, yeah. Any wind, like a yeah. little puff, and twenty degrees over. Because that was it, that's what our boat was built to do to reach all speed. But yeah. um, unfortunately, now we only go down to about ten to fifteen degrees. Yeah. What's, which is fine with me. Yeah. What happens <laughs> is we we reef at fifteen degrees because we're like, oh, we're kind of leaning a bit. Like you know, stuff's gonna fall over. I find junk rig boats to be beautiful yeah i i i like i've never sailed on one have you i have not sailed on yeah. one i've read a lot about them and they are awesome but i still like this the bermuda rig <laughs> well, synthetic rigging makes that much of a difference yes yeah, it does mm -hmm. it's hundreds of pounds and then it's weight aloft so it's yeah really impressive as you as you go higher up the weight ratio becomes higher so you it, yeah. everything so you figure one pound like here is one pound and or one foot pound and then actually no it's zero foot pounds it's <laughs> at one foot up it's now one foot pound at 10 feet up it's 10 foot pounds so the same thing at the top of your mast if it's 60 feet in the air you're talking 60 times the weight do you know sv seeker do you yes. follow the build uh i don't follow it as much uh i know he's building that steel boat for like the past 10 years or so that, that's <laughs> about it yeah He's a junk rig. Uh, I think he's building a schooner. I think. It, I don't it's, know. It's big. A really big boat. The last I saw of SV Seeker was when they did the fake explosion. and That was kind of the last of that. Yeah. yeah we kind of got it. Yep. <laughs> oh, uh, make and model of wisdom. It's a uh, Morgan 45. From 1968. Yeah, so because they've then made many 45s, it's the 45-1, which they did because... It's the one that Carl yeah. all. Carl Alberg. It's the one that Morgan Charlie Morgan Charlie Morgan uh designed to beat the rules yeah, was, in the Whitbird race. Whitbread. Whit Whitbread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was built as a it was designed as a rule beater and then they <laughs> changed the rules and they sold yeah. twelve. And we actually did an entire uh live video previously all about a total tour of our boat and its history. If that interests you, you should check it out. That's a long one, sorry. Yeah. Wait, whenever uh, we do this, wait, we're like yeah, reading yeah. a comment. So he was saying that we could raise the motor up. Yeah. So we could raise the motor up with belts and all. And it currently is belts that get it to the shaft. The problem is then it comes up into our floor. Uh, yeah, the, the, salon, the sole so. is ah too low for that. So, yes. we Our little dog, Morty. Yes, we're going to get him back. He's coming soon. back. Yes, Don't worry. Yes. Um, as yeah, soon he's as at we, her parents' house. Yeah, as soon as we hit uh, the Florida. Florida Keys, or Florida, Florida Keys, yeah. we're going to go get Morty. We're going to rent a car and go back up. He's currently with my parents, and they love him, and they're going to be very sad to see him go, but we're going to be even happier to have him back on the boat where he belongs. Yes. Yeah. Most of you probably don't know about him because we only have him in the very beginning of our episodes before we left the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Morty. <laughs> He's yeah. a corgi. He's the best. That's pretty much all you need to know. <laughs> He'll be in all the future videos. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you think oh, I, of the Hinterholer yeah. boats? So I don't know them, but I know Wishbone Rigs. Uh, also, they're cool. I like the concept of them, but I don't personally like them for myself. Yeah. I mean, the thing about boating is it's so personal. Yeah. I mean, you can you can recognize okay. that something is good, but don't want it for yourself. So, so here's my big reason why I don't want a junk or uh, a wishbone is if it breaks, no one really knows them. So like trying to find like you might know the guy near where your boat lives that can fix it and work on it and all. But like. You pull into a third world country port, they've never seen the thing. They don't know what to do with it. And it's like, how do you get that fixed? So that's, yeah. How is it to sail with pets? It's very difficult. Yeah. Um, if you're doing coastal sailing, it's fine. 
But the problem is for us, we were crossing oceans and we were, you know, doing a lot of very long, like thousand mile um, sales. And it's just, it's not fair to the pet because, you know, they really well, do. Well, it depends on the pet. Yeah, it depends for dogs. on the pet. Well, it depends on the dog. So what yeah. happens is our dog would not go on the boat. Like, <laughs> well, correction, he would not go on the deck. He would poop in the galley if we didn't take him to shore. And if we didn't take him to shore long enough, like, many things. But the thing about just in general traveling with pets is you're not giving them exercise that they need, yeah. dogs. And you're not, um, they need pet passports. And for many of these well, for places. Europe. Yeah, for Europe. For many of these places that we were going, you needed shot records and uh, vaccine re vaccination records that were only valid for less than the length of the trip it took us to get there. Yeah. So it would be very difficult for us to travel with any pets like that. Um, every country you come into, they ask you, do you have pets on board? You know, it's a whole thing. We did run into some people in Horta who were traveling with chickens. And they had pet passports. <laughs> which I thought was amazing. Yeah, that um, was awesome. And we know people, like, MJ sails with a cat, and I think cats are probably the best thing to sail with because they don't need to come off the boat. But in all honesty, uh, it's very difficult sailing with pets, and we don't regret our decision to leave Morty uh, back in Baltimore, but we do miss him every day, and it's yeah. one of the hardest things about now, leaving. The <laughs> other thing is, if you're sailing internationally, yeah. then the pets are an issue. Uh, but also, also if yeah. you want to fly back to like visit yeah. friends, mm -hmm. uh, some airlines don't take pets. And like, we would literally get there and be like, all right, when is the next cheapest flight? And we just hop on the plane and go. And there was no issues. If yeah. we had a dog, it'd be, you know, paperwork and just issues. It becomes, yeah, really complicated and very expensive. Yeah. So the one airline that we saw, it was a hundred dollars for the pet ticket. And then another one, it was, you had to buy a ticket for the pet at like whatever the price was it's like eesh. brand loyalty is a thing same with big trucks i'd rather burn to the frame rails beside the road to okay <laughs> um, right. sorry jim i don't know what that, yeah. that was probably in reference to something else i i didn't follow uh how do i get a rigger to answer my call so i can pay them to help me <laughs> get herbie to be your rigger <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Join on Patreon. We have uh, several <laughs> patrons that that's what they do. Actually, yeah, a so. lot of our patrons do uh, just, they've become patrons so that they can have Herbie kind of as an on-call rigger. And I'm, that's... I'm entertainer, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he does, so... <laughs> yeah, like, um, rigging questions and, like, troubleshooting and stuff. That's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and other than that, depends on the rigger. You yeah. just have to find so, a good one. <laughs> so that's actually the thing with, uh, again, with the junk rig or the wishbone... You get to somewhere, a Bermudan rig, every single boat has it, so they know how to work with them. So if you don't know how to fix it yourself, anywhere you go, someone can. Uh, and if you know how to fix it yourself, you can get parts anywhere. Uh, with specialized rigs, it's tricky. Yeah. And, you know, when we get back to the United States, we're happy to travel for a rigging job. So. Yep, we're going to be coming up the coast, so <laughs> yeah. anyone along the way. And Oh, so that was the other thing with pets. If you're traveling nationally and not internationally, take them. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Cause, Don't yeah. leave them behind. Yeah, so that's why we're going to pick them up, and then our pets are coming up the whole East Coast back to the States. Yeah. Or back to Maryland. Chesapeake. Yeah, and we're taking our time getting back there. We're going to be having all kinds of adventures on our way. Yes. And the pets will be there for all of them. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, guys, um, I think, I think we've hit them all. Yeah. Uh, you have. You now know our totally biased personal criteria for the perfect cruising boat. Um, it's completely personalized for us. What we love doesn't mean that <laughs> yeah. you have to love it too. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not running aground. Yes. That is. <laughs> but probably running aground. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully not every day again, because yeah. that was rough. Yeah. Yeah, so our big plan is to travel the ICW when people are going, and it's been dredged recently, yeah. and it's, you know, deep. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we, really, 200 people. This is awesome. I think this is a record for a live video for us, so this has been really fun for us, especially getting the chance to kind of have back and forths with you and talk to you and answer your questions. Yeah. 
the, to the best of our abilities. Um, when are you going to oh. show us another time lapse art piece, Johnny? I have a lot of them ready to go, but the problem with that is that the YouTube algorithm hates it when I show my art. <laughs> yeah, it really does. And so, like right now, we're actually doing quite well. Like we're getting mm -hmm. a lot of views. And if we put out a video that we know is not going to get many views, it's going to just kind of like tank us. Yeah. So actually, though, if you are interested in the art time lapse videos, they're unlisted. We have them. They are unlisted, and you can secretly see them by just going to the playlist. Yeah. Of Maddie's art. So the same with all these videos that I haven't published yet, on like uh, two topics. They're yeah. all in the playlist because it's good info. Like I. I would feel bad holding it back. Like, it exists, it can help someone, and I'm like, I'm not going to put that out yet. It's like, no, like, here's the info. If you want it, you can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it'll go public yeah. in the future. And somebody did mention starting a sister channel, which, interesting yeah. that you should mention that. <laughs> we're, we're we doing are that. doing that. Um, not for my art, that is coming in the future, but we have actually already started a sister channel, which is called Charm City Chewers. It's not... It, none of the videos are public yet. But yeah, if they're you also go, all unlisted. Yeah, if you go and subscribe, then um, it'd be awesome for us to kind of start that channel with subscribers. It's Charm City Chewers because it's just us talking about and rating in a very specific and special way some restaurants that are near and dear to our hearts. Yeah, because we've been... We love eating. And if yeah. you've noticed, we don't buy fuel, we buy food. <laughs> yeah, and it's all about food for us. Yeah. So. Uh, so this is just like a really intimate, cool look at restaurant experiences, specifically in Baltimore, but we're going to be broadening that. Spreading that, yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, um, to wrap things up, what's the name again? Uh, oh. Charm City Chewers. And I, I hope it comes up in search. Yeah. Because it... I don't know. It's so <laughs> small. I don't know if it's... Yeah. I mean, it has zero subscribers. So. The, yeah. Um, yeah, be the first. Oh, yeah. Actually. <laughs> be the first to subscribe. Charm City Chewers. Uh, C-H-A-R-M-C-I-T-Y-C-H-E-W-E-R-S. Chewers. Like chewing on food. <laughs> yeah, it currently has zero subscribers. Yeah. <laughs> Written like this. <laughs> it's got, uh, the logo is like a little fork, knife, and spoon on a C. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> oh, so Hi, there Phil. was a question about which composting toilet we have. We have the... Nature's head. Nature's head. The air head, the bowl is a little shorter. So that's really the big difference. They yeah. both work the same. Um, so yeah, okay. 107 minute video. <laughs> Gosh, guys, thanks for staying on this long, and uh, quick big hello to those of you who just joined. I hope that you can rewind and watch from the beginning, uh, and we really are excited to see you probably. If we have good enough internet, we'll do another live video in Cape Verde. Otherwise, our next live video will be in Suriname. As long as they have good internet as well. As long as they have good internet. <laughs> so, uh... You're anchoring in the Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming. We'll see you later. We really hope this video finds you in good health uh, with COVID and everything. And we're thinking about all of you guys from afar. Nope. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>